Okay, welcome. It's good to see you again, Greg. Good so to good. See you too, good Alan. to introduce you to my, your friend uh, Derek and everything. Look forward to talking to it. And in the audience, uh, welcome very, very much to Conversation. Old friend of Conversations, that being uh, Greg Canizaro, is here. Again, we haven't seen him in a long time. It's really good to see him again. And he's brought with him his colleague, Derek Marrero. 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 Yes, sir. And they're both from, uh, Greg is CEO, and Mr. Marraro is the, uh, Greg, Derek is the VP for Development for a very interesting organization called Indie Gems Films, and it has to do with uh, vid uh, production of film, and gentlemen, welcome very, very much to Conversation. Thank you. Thank Good you. to meet you. Good to meet you. And we're old friends. So Absolutely. share with us a little bit, Greg, uh, your own background. You did that, for, last time we did a program with you, it was on that one about the Italians. Absolutely. What Prisoners was that thing called? Us. What was Prisoners it? Among Us. That was a good film. It was about. It the, really was well done. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, it was about the um, Italians during um, the time of being in internment camps here in the United States. Right, right. And um, their plight. And very good documentary. Yeah. Very proud of it. Yeah. Um, still selling today. And it is okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Absolutely. Among Absolutely. the paisanos, particularly. Ah, the paisanos. Right. Yeah. 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 But anyway, no, it was good. And you cut you cut your teeth on that in terms of filmmaking or um, had documentary you done stuff wise. Yeah. I've been making films for many many years. Had you before that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I've been in the business since the eighties. Since the eighties, in the business of filmmaking. And uh, Indie Gems Films is your company, and you were making before that, that was a documentary. It's a different thing, a documentary than, say, a feature film or something, or, uh, you know. But what kind of work were you doing film-wise uh, before you did, uh, any, you know, that film? Well, I um, started out in the business with um, being mentored by... Uh a genius, the way I look at it, yeah. Dominic Serio, okay. and uh, he got me into HBO, and uh, Mr. Serio, uh, the uh, vice president of technical productions for HBO, yeah. and that's where I cut my teeth. Oh, really? You were with HBO? HBO right is down on cool. 23rd Street. HBO is great. Yeah, I think the best programming is at HBO. Yeah. Really created a great creative atmosphere yeah. for all of the people underneath him, and uh, from there, uh, what were you doing? I was. I started out as uh, a technician, Tec to, uh, a tape op kind of guy. Okay. And uh, as the years went on, uh, yeah. Mr. Serio uh, developed the E Entertainment Network. Okay. And, yeah. And uh, uh -huh. building that facility, mm -hmm. and uh, gave me an opportunity to come out there. Mm -hmm. And I started out in sound and worked my way up, camera, and eventually I started producing a show called Talk Soup out in California. Okay. Good. In Cal so you have roots here in New York and also in California. Absolutely. Yeah. Lived out there for 14 years, as well as uh, Derek. You saw also roots in California. Mm -hmm. Yep, boots here and there. Uh huh. Yeah. And you've been in the business for quite a while. Yeah, I've been in and around the industry. For What's years. your background then? Well, see, started off um, visual arts. Mm -hmm. uh, school for visual arts? Um, no, oh, well, in oh. visual arts themselves, yeah. Not the school for? No, not the no. school. Okay. No, I, I went to college at the State University of New York at Purchase. Oh, yeah, right. Art and filmmaking. Uh, in for, okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yep. Um, worked in independent films, short films, things like that. Uh -huh. Like narrative, non narrative type stuff. And then moved to California. Advertising spots and stuff, or yeah, industrials, or a little bit of everything. Actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then moved to California about 15 years ago now. Yeah, about 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Stayed Time flies. Oh no, kidding. Yeah. It gets worse with each age of year. <laughs> you I'm faster. here to inform you. It <laughs> goes like know. lightning. We yeah. know that as well. Yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you wouldn't know from old. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. you went, what took you to California? Was it um, the job? It was time for a change. Okay. It was time uh -huh. for a change. You know, I was born and bred here, mm -hmm. Lower East Side, mm -hmm. then moved to Queens when I was, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And then it was just time for a change to make a clean break. You mm -hmm. know, see what's going on out west. Mm -hmm. Lived in San Francisco for 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, worked in and around the industry there. Did a lot of different things. Then family pulled me back here. Okay, you got family here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You too, Greg, got family? Absolutely. Here? Yeah, absolutely. A big family? We're both. Big family? Lots of uncles and stuff? Oh. Oh, uncles, aunts, cousins, all of that so stuff. So come, uh, I've never been invited Derek's, uh, to a family. Derek's born and raised down. <laughs> I've been invited, invited to a family outing at the uh, park or something. Oh, yeah. come on I along, mean, I meet all Come on along. Well, it's an that? Italian yeah. thing. Well, Absolutely. let me know. Huh? He's, a, he, he's a born and uh, raised uh, native of uh, the Lower East Side here in New York City. Thompson Square area? Mm -hmm. or what? Was born across the street from Thompson Square. Were you there before the gentrification? Yes, well before that, yeah. Were you again or against the squatters? 
I knew a lot of people who were squatters. Yeah. So my allegiances, I guess, were towards them. You're with the folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, gonna be down with the people. Yeah. Right. Right. Down <laughs> with the people. Right. That's good. Yeah. Not down with the people, but down. Down with the people. There you go. Exactly. Intonations, everything. Isn't it? You know, in terms of acting and that. But you've been involved in that, too, and you picked it up. Uh, Craig, you've been, you've been doing the film, and maybe you could talk a little about Indie Gems film. Is it always, if what you've been doing always been called Indie Gems, or when did you pick up the name? And share us a little well, bit background, and then we <laughs> want to let you know because you're out looking for talent, writers, and so forth. It's mm -hmm. all over your site, which mm -hmm. is rich, mm -hmm. and you're looking for good talent, new properties, and new possibilities for uh, films that could be finding their way into the into the root world of film. Absolutely. Yeah. Good for you. Is we need that kind of thing to support the people that are independent producers. Indie is independent. Yeah. There you go. We um, started in uh, 2000, mm -hmm. uh, formed the company, um, along with our president, uh, Paula Schwartz, mm -hmm. Emmy-nominated producer. And um, our vision was basically to find talent and discover new people that to make the, which we thought was the stagnant world of the indie film business mm -hmm. and find like the new John Cassavetes and those kinds That's of great. individuals. Great. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so we, we started out and we made a couple of feature films, uh, distributed them, um, executive producer uh, Stephen King's Lucky Quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it just grew from there. And then How long I, have you guys been connected? You well, two? we've been together for like quite some time now. No, a little more quantity. All right, let me go on. Um, well, three years? Three, okay, thank you. Um, That's yeah. different than... But I, I've time. known Derek and yeah. uh, Derek um, turned around and uh, he took the company in a really exciting direction direction mm. to make us more relevant on the internet with different kinds of ideas uh -huh. and uh, he suggested also to uh, get into the blog business and we're both into old films okay. and uh, lots of young people don't respect those films they're just looking into the you know the action movies and stuff like that mm -hmm. and um, Derek said that it would be great to like start a blog and the first subject matter would be Alan Barron's Blast of Silence okay. which yeah. was shot here in New York City in the 60s mm -hmm. and uh, that's a film yes. oh yeah Sorry, I'm not it's a, it's a wonderful be, film I should know is it Netflix and stuff yeah they do have it on Netflix Blast absolutely Oh, so this is a film I should know about? Mm-hmm. Well, you can I'm find it on our blog. It's yeah. blog.indiegemsfilms.com. Was that about the same and time as Mean Streets and that? Uh, or no, no, it predates it, but it actually Pre really influenced Mean Streets. Did it really? Yeah, yeah? Scorsese yeah. has been name-dropping it for years, yeah. and it finally came out on video through Criterion two years ago. Okay, and what was your connection with the film? Um, it was just a favorite of ours. Oh, you yeah. like, yeah? It's, I mean, it was filmed here in the city, and yeah. it's an area you don't really see that often. Right, films. right. It was yeah. done, like, in the village on St. Mm -hmm. Mark's Place, the West Village, yeah. Harlem, Midtown, yeah. and it's all sh places that you just don't normally see in a film. Not glamorous, sexy spots, right. but uh -huh. places that are real. Real stuff. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. So you got a real feel for the city and for the time. And for the time and for the hard scrabble exactly. often that accompanies those areas. Exactly. You familiar with Wahida Clark? Mm, well, Heather Clark's a writer. She writes in what is called the thug. Mm -hmm. She writes, she's really good. She did a lot of time, she had to do time, and her husband had to do time mm -hmm. in prison and everything like that. She writes in the vernacular of the street real, right. and she's just soaring like uh, getting all kinds of support mm -hmm. as a writer. She wrote uh, Thug Love, uh, no, Thugs and the Women Who Love Them, and it's for people who are in a hard scrabble way right. and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, yeah. out of prisons and in and mm -hmm. out of prisons. Wow. I just wonder, because she's got a huge following yeah. literature. Right. And does uh, it still hold that you need a property to make a film, that writers are important, or can you just wing it? <laughs> well, th the way we look at it is, is that the writers seem to always take a back seat. And to us, they're one of the most integral, important people that you could do creatively wise yeah. because without their scripts, yeah. without their vision, you have nothing to work with. What about a writer like F. Scott Fitzgerald or somebody who would write and then mm -hmm. they would somebody else would do the screenplay? Mm -hmm. So if you're writing, it's linear, like Michener. Right. Okay. Michener writes ha, 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 uh, Hawaii. Right. And he takes eight pages to describe standing on a headland in Hawaii mm -hmm. and he's talking about the blue sky and the calling bird and the breeze blowing from the south and eight pages of right. linear strung out to describe what in a real sense if you were standing there you would experience multi-sensorily or mm -hmm. multimedia mm -hmm. wise in a moment mm -hmm. all well, at once it's a different thing the writing yeah. and then the screenwriting is different 
it's cinema, the screenwriting is cinematographic and almost necessarily. I well, guess. sometimes so, the, is, you know. the translation gets a little bit convoluted for yeah. cinematic purposes. Um, as you were saying with F. Scott Fitzgerald, like The Great Gatsby, yeah. they did a wonderful movie yeah. with interpreting his work, but your imagination, when you're reading something, is much more vivid than you might see on a screen. And lots of times, Hollywood doesn't make the translation exactly the way you expect it if you're a fan of the book. Yeah, there's often yeah. difficulty between the author of the book and the yeah. people what they come out with, mm -hmm. too, is there not? In the history of cinema. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Well, they put they them can. on a the back seat, and then they do that Hollywood thing, yeah, and, uh, you know. Throw them back, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they can ruin it, sometimes they can get so it right. So what's the business like? You hang out in Santa Monica and all that, and, <laughs> and what is the, is the Here and now shorts with a cocktail. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, so you got that. So how close is the movie, what is it, the producer? The, the one with Tim Robbins is the producer. I, I the think one with Tim Robbins. Yeah, yeah I, I would think that that the Robert Robbins Altman film. I think Robert that Robert Altman with Tim Robbins as the star mm -hmm. is that is that Hollywood or is that just baloney? Uh, no, I I think that yeah. it's quite it accurate. Pretty negative from like fiction of things, you know. Well, he told it as it is. Oh, that negative. Well, you know, sometimes like you know the scene where they just take a newspaper and go, look, I can just pitch you a story, take this article and then turn it into this and whatnot. You know, it's it's seems pretty accurate you mm -hmm. know and then sometimes it's a little bit different where yeah. they get a great script and by the time it goes through their mill mm -hmm. it might not be the way it started Thalberg used to be respected in that when they are doing Thalberg, the movies yeah. and that and the writers are yeah okay oh he was an amazing producer yeah. also yeah, but, you know he, with the Marx Brothers yeah he had Marx great Brothers. instinct and uh, were they funny oh like god that? you can't make movies like that difference today. between the West Coast and the East Coast the venue or the, uh, the vibe between the indie movement. Well, they say left coast and right coast. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, but different or? To me, there's a more um, neo-realism feel with the filmmakers here on the East Coast. Right. Um, out there, it's more of um, a commercial, get the big blockbuster, and uh, yeah. I think that over here on the East Coast, it's more uh, organic and you're and into real. the organic you're looking you're not mm -hmm. even looking for the big blockbuster I suppose if it happened you know it would be fine but you're oh yeah financially that's great but we're, we're looking yeah. to just tell interesting stories tell and, interesting stories and not to have someone dictate how we want to interpret or tell our stories you don't want to be bossed around no I, I mean I, I've been in both sides of the seats mm -hmm. and you know it, it, it's not a matter of that it's just that in the independent film world I think there is more artistic license and freedom yeah, right, that right. you might not have when you're working with big companies, the MGMs or the Sonys, yeah. where that big dollar is very important and it's all based on getting to that target audience. And it's also something called production values. Have you been able to put a grid on what the hell a production value connotes? Or well, I think it's... Are um, you trying to reach for that or is there gritty reality is different than production values like an MGM musical with Esther Williams or something or... Oh, well... You know, you know. I, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. What is a production puzzly value? I'm puzzling about the kind of thing. That they uh, always have on the bottom line to get those budgets way the hell up and make a lot of money on the outcome. Well, it depends on how much money they're going to give you to yeah. make that film. I mean, if they're giving you $100 million, you know, you basically have like a city of employees that can make that happen. Right. But when you're working in the realms that we are, mm -hmm. we try to keep a great production value at a low cost. What is it? Give me a, okay, what's a definition, what's a dictionary definition of production value vis in terms of the film uh, fair? Well, it's, it's not that simple. The production oh. value also is always going to dictate your budget. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we want to shoot a scene in a bar, Mm -hmm. And in the independent film world, we would actually speak with the owners and try to capture it that way. Mm -hmm. With a big production and having that kind of budget money, mm -hmm. it tends to be, well, we don't need to go to New York and shoot the bar. Mm -hmm. We have enough of money to recreate the bar on a soundstage. So that's basically it. Uh, lots of independent films have wonderful production values with a little bit of money to make it happen. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how they execute it and the kind of art direction that they have and production designers and what they can do within those limits. And I think that that challenge is what inspires independent filmmakers Thank you. to rise above it. Seems to me like that. You too, you're in development. But mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me you got an awful lot of sets. 
that are just part of the environment, exactly. that are just perfect, you know? Yeah. If you can pick them right, and then you have to negotiate something. Do you have to negotiate? Suppose you're shooting a film, do you have to negotiate with the city or the permission? Or can you just work it out uh, on the fly, as it were? Or is there any problem with bureaucracy about people trying to hit you up for money or anything? Doing, no, absolutely. Where you're going to shoot yeah. and, and what you're going to shoot as so well. Washington, and plus, you want to. You got a scene in Washington Square of a right. two lovers meeting or something mm -hmm. or for a discussion. Well, in and our business, it's called you can steal the shot. Yeah, okay. But I think that you it's. Use that term. Right, just going in there with no permits. It's yeah. called guerrilla filmmaking. Yeah. Shoot it, hope that the cops don't shut you down and stuff like that. Would they if they saw but, you? Would they? Well, are you breaking the law? Are you well, absolutely. Term? People can get hurt. Uh -huh. Things can happen. Yeah, with no As like or anything. What yeah. Sterick's been doing also is, you know, working with the mayor's office and mm -hmm. uh, bringing in all of these uh, wonderful ideas mm -hmm. of the opportunities that the uh, New York City Film Commission offers to independent filmmakers. What? Like what? Well, in terms of advertising, for example, you okay, can, talk, you can do yeah. like on bus shelters. You can get a poster on there. Mm -hmm. um, there's what else? Insurance you can get with, with the city as well. Insurance and, against, um, against what do you have to have insurance for when you're shooting a movie? Um, like and damages or or to the actors or to the crew, things like that. Or to the people yeah, that are exactly. in the scene in the area mm -hmm. who might be. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, insurance can, okay, mm -hmm. and that's important oh, yeah. in order to be covered in a quote legitimate way? Mm -hmm. exactly. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, you work with the city because everybody wins, basically. You're mm -hmm. creating something in the city that will give them free advertising. Mm -hmm. and you're Yeah, that's right. They must get a fee. They, they get advantage to that. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was initially free, actually, but now now there's a, a nominal fee. That's I think it started this summer, if I'm not mistaken. They're not, they're not twisting your arm. No. Mm -hmm. No, they're, they're trying to trying give to, you incentives. They're not trying to milk you. No, no, no. They're not. No. They're you know, not. you're talking about the city. Mm -hmm. Mr. No, surprisingly, Bloomberg they're not trying to milk you here. They're right. not. They're trying to help. They're mm -hmm. trying to give we're you incentives to, to film to here, mm -hmm. in which mm -hmm. Derek and I consider the greatest city. Exception. You know, we're here from the IRS. We're here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they come in there with their cars. No thanks. But independent guerrilla theater. I mean, guerrilla theater and then guerrilla filmmaking are sort of the same. Mm -hmm. Mean Streets. So when Mean Streets was made, mm -hmm. was that done with all the compliance of the government, or was that there, or that was a different era? That back in the seventies, I guess. Well, the seventies, the city was close to bankrupt too, so yeah. they took what they could get. You and know. you could just go anywhere and make the film and get out of the. You can do it fast because they got the. I got a friend of mine who can go and she's got a little lens. She's got a thing. It's just a you can stream. Mm -hmm. And we did it the other day. Reed, you were over there. Reed Stowe. We ought to say, "There's Reed Stowe." Mm -hmm. Talk about the people who don't recognize a real, honest to God American hero right out of life, mm -hmm. and everything like that. But she was streaming. She had a little thing, a little thing that stood on a camera. She had the lens the size of a pinhead, <laughs> and it's knockout vision uh, quality in terms of the video that's captured. With amazing, that. yeah, amazing. There's a lot of things going on, that and it opens it up easier to get yeah. really good quality, yeah. high def stuff and everything has now become available to the filmmaker, uh, independent filmmaker. And uh, it used to be you'd have to have a great, it would have been a whole different thing in the 50s. Mm. Definitely. Oh, it is absolutely. now with the camcorders yeah. and everything. Absolutely. It's accessible. becoming very, yeah, more democratic. Yes. And also yeah. all kinds of things with Final Cut and mm -hmm. things you can do yep. that it makes filmmaking easier yeah. to the individual citizen. Exactly. So absolutely. Guess, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And we've been going in um, uh, some other really very creative um, directions. Uh, we're also now developing... Uh, comic book that we're going to be doing and really? um, hopefully yeah. um, taking that to another level uh -huh. and um, bringing it into um, a series and um, Derek's been uh, spearheading mm -hmm. that and he found an amazing yeah. artist. Yeah, this gentleman named Michael McLaughlin. Mm. He's just, he's got it together. He's got the eye for it, the feel for it. He's, you know, for the ever, street? Mm -hmm. For a little bit. Like Crumb or no? No, no, no. No, this is, he's got... Uh, maybe a filmmaker's eye, because okay, there's, yeah, right. there's definitely common ground between a filmmaker and a, and a comic book artist. I guess there would be, wouldn't there? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, it's basically yeah. creating storyboards. Right, right, you know, right, right. Having right. the story flow. That's true. And yeah. Michael has, he has the feel for it, as being, being an avid comic book reader as well, which helps. Uh, 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 a an, comic book reader, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, yeah. But it's just, yeah, it's, there's a lot of, well, Alan Barron it goes back to, uh, with Blast of Silence. Mm. He was a comic book artist initially. Really? And okay. then when you see the movie, it feels like panels from a page. I you see. Know, each of it, each scene is very like, you could just 
take each still from the film and it's just it's an actual you know panel yeah so. a work of art exactly yeah, like a frame yeah. exactly yeah, yeah okay mm -hmm. And you're developing that now. Yeah, what what what's how many films have you made or been able to, mm -hmm. and what's the process by which you find? Like, I'll go over to the, off on my own a minute here. Say, so I walk through life. I feel like I live in the. I maybe a psychological problem I have, but I feel like I live in the middle of a movie that's called life. Mm -hmm. And everywhere I go, I see Academy Award performances mm -hmm. by the cab driver shaking his fist and he's really into it. Yeah. You can only wish you had and a camera to thought, capture it. If you just had a camera to capture it in the right light, you'd have Academy Award performances. You Absolutely. Know I mean? You know what I mean? That's yeah. like living We totally with agree Beck, with that. You know, Absolutely. Julian Beck and Jul uh, Judith Molina and all that and everything. But you got all these kind of things go going on. But what is it? How do you uh, select? How many have you been able to put to in the can, as they say? And where does it all stand? What's in development? Where do you stand? Because you had the one from the Italians in internment mm -hmm. and everything. That's five or six years ago you and I spoke. But what's been developing since? How many of you actually got produced films? What's the trials and tribulations of that? What is the, I don't want to use the term market, but let's say the distribution capabilities for various forms of film, mm -hmm. because you go all the way from documentary to uh, love story mm -hmm. to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So lay it out for me, and particularly in terms of what you've been, you guys have been up to at Indie Gems Films, if you could. What's the status of well, filmmaking what we have done, for the citizens? Well, we did um, a comedy, a slacker comedy called uh, Get a Job. Slacker. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. Alan Garfield, Academy mm -hmm. Award winner. Mm -hmm. um, he won the Academy Award. Absolutely, in the conversation. We did, um, we did, uh, and that was Jeremy London and Marilyn Gagliotti from Clerks. That was distributed by Taurus Entertainment. Taurus Entertainment is a distributor of Is film? a distributor, yes, of, of films. Film. Is it theatrical film? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, after uh, that, we uh, did the Stephen King Project. Then we uh, just uh, filmed down in Jamaica. We did a comedy called Hanging in Hito with the iconic George Jefferson, uh, really? Sherman Hemsley, and uh, Judy Tenuta, Tracy Bigham. And uh, that uh, is distributed by Echelon Studios. And right now we uh, just finished um, Hollywood Sarah. Um, basically, it's um, a serial killer kind of film, but done in a very auteur kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, done in Los Angeles. Auteur, I think of that as somebody who, when somebody does everything, like Alan, Woody Allen's auteur. When you see the film, you, I, I can't describe it till you see it. Mm -hmm. Right now, that's in our post-production. We're in pre-production with a film called St. Mark's Place. Um, we're working with um, Tom Lesu, mm -hmm. who is um, an incredible artist. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom also has a company called Film Synergy, mm -hmm. which uh, is based here in New York. And the company basically um, takes artists to find the common ground where they meet together and they brainstorm and make projects happen. So mm -hmm. if anybody wants to see um, Tom's uh, company, it's filmsynergy.com, mm -hmm. uh, the comic book. And now we're doing a mm -hmm. cyber mm -hmm. television show so that we're going to release on uh, Blip TV. Wait a minute, you're going to put it on Blip. Blip mm -hmm. is a, thing that a lot of people here who do their program, put them up on Blip. It's great because you can stream things around the mm -hmm. world and everything. That's a great distribution yeah. vehicle. And it's going to be called um, IGF TV, Indie Gem Films Television, and Derek and I are the hosts. Oh, you're going to be the host of a, what, like a talk thing or guests? Or it's going to be like an entertain. Movie, well, right? what it's going to be is like an entertainment tonight dealing with old time films and the artists. What's entertainment tonight? Like entertainment tonight, the TV show? I don't think I've ever seen that. Access Hollywood? I don't think I've ever seen that either. Okay. I see um, a lot of scenes. Well, basically what it is is Derek and I <laughs> are, are going to be analyzing really interesting avenues oh, good. about good. artists. Right. So, so for and example, we did Alan Barron. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Next month we're doing Ida Lupino. Mm -hmm. and well, what do you mean you're going to do Ida Lupino? Oh, we're going to, we're going to talk about Ida Lupino. Actress, right? yeah, but she was also an independent film artist. Too. I didn't know. That's right. She directed. Exactly. The she first directed female director. director. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I remember. Yeah, she started, started her own company. So what are you going to, you're going to talk about that show, clips or something? Yeah. And I do everything, do some, depending upon the theme, do location things, mm -hmm. like if it was done in the city, we'll utilize some of that. We are you going to stream it to the internet as you do it, or are you, gonna, you are going to stream it on a website? On website? Yeah. And then stream, okay. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could back up a little bit. So yeah. you did a slacker thing. 
Mm -hmm. I remember the film Slacker. Do you remember the film yeah. Slacker, Richard mm -hmm. Linklater? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That was a great film. Absolutely. Brilliant. And it was just people walking around exactly. and seeing. Exactly. And that opening scene yeah. when he's in the cab, and he's in the cab, and he said, I saw this lady, I got off the bus, I could have gone with her this way, my whole life would have been different. That's really true of life. You know, it's a lot oh, like a the... A little change can yeah, make a big change into your, yeah. your life's... Pro you know. It's a lot like um, this film called Sliding Doors, mm -hmm. where they go onto the yeah. train and... Yeah. Exactly. One I haven't seen that. I don't that came out a few years ago with uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it was more of a bigger budget thing. Yeah. You know, it pro probably it was theme sort of based on Slackers. I think Linklater put that together. Uh, Linklater yeah, later. Linklater, yeah, yeah, Richard. Yeah. He, mm -hmm. Great Dre did uh, the Days or something. Yep, Days and Confused. Days, Days and Confused. Confused mm -hmm. and all that. But he was really funny because they just went from one thing to another. Exactly. And, then and yeah. they seemed like just real honest to God Slacker people. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I don't think they were any famous stars. I don't think it was just either. folks down in all. Austin. Austin, yeah. Mm. Well, when you have like a great hippie, story, yeah, you know, exactly. hippie people, real yeah. honest God people. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But when you have a great story and a great director, you cast it properly. You really don't need big names. Mm. The story will stand on its own. As yeah. long as the actors are connected to the material, it'll always come across wonderful. Okay. Now you think of yourself as a director. Yourself, I'm talking to. Again. I, 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 I mean, think I'm of myself as a filmmaker. A filmmaker. I could produce. I could direct. I can write. I'm. I'm not on an ego trip to do every department. Mm -hmm. But I just look at myself as a filmmaker. You don't connect uh, ego trip with auteur. That's where somebody's got control over everything. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody's got total control, and you. Well, you know, we do. We said. do, but in in a, in a very mellow sense. Yeah, a mellow. We know. We leave each department and the a artists for that department right. to do their thing. A mellow ego. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We don't come in there with that hammer and <laughs> go, hey, you. None of the sledgehammer. <laughs> no, no, it's not no. us. No. Everyone's a contributor. But you're so. dealing with creative and you hear filmmaking is collaborative. Yeah. Is it true? Filmmaking is collaborative? Absolutely. Absolutely. It should be, yeah. So then the auteur is, auteur, am I wrong in my interpretation? The auteur is where somebody's got complete control and you hear people saying nothing good was ever made by a committee. And a lot of artists say, mm, that's hey, you know, you're going to get a committee and the artist is a Picasso and he's mm -hmm. painting blue and there's somebody right. says I think we should have red slash in here and you yeah. don't have that kind of you know what I'm well, saying well in terms of create because you're yeah. dealing with 50-50 uh, the thing is is that you know it's a collaborative art mm -hmm. but somebody has to have the vision to steer the ship and that's the because if everybody is steering the ship, it's yeah. going to go this way that way and this that's way someone has to keep the focus and exactly. that won't work right yeah. right no and that's the director, by and large, that does it. Film is a director's medium? I would say yes. Television is a producer's medium? Uh, I would say a writer's medium a with writer's TV medium because television? the writers get the executive producer credits. The writers are usually the creators of the TV shows. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a... It's a different aspect. Yeah, okay, it's different. So, talk some more. Now, you've got these films you've done, you've, you, and, and you went through it fast because it's your territory and you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. But, like, when I think, because I'm just Joe Q. Citizen, and I don't know much about films since... Uh, oh, Harold, you no, know a no, lot no, about no, films. Catherine Hepburn, I mean, <laughs> you know, G Jimmy Stewart and stuff. But anyway, but you talked to a couple of distributors. I used to think MGM, Paramount Pictures, uh, United Artists, and the films that were familiar with the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and so forth. But you got a whole lot of, is it a new ball game? Have you got new distributing vehicles? And also the uh, actual studio a system which is going to put together also the producer that can raise what money is needed to get the damn thing done and everything and what they call green lighted and everything. What's the reality of the realm in which you work? And you said you is distributed by some company distributed by another that I had never heard of. What's the reality on the indie film menu? Because a lot of the people viewing this program are probably budding independent filmmakers, some mm -hmm. do gospel music, some do other things, they got all kinds of things. What's the reality for the citizens that are doing something with multimedia and interested in development, maybe funding or something, and also distribution? The reality is that in most cases in the independent film world that you do not have a, a distributor attached. You go and you make your film. After you make your film, if you are successful with the product, you put it into certain film festivals where certain distributors might be there and be interested in it. 
Okay, how many and then hopefully you could strike a deal. Now? Is it open season? There's, there's two there 10, open season. I mean, uh, what's the reality, particularly now with the internet and everything? It, what's the it used to be the studios. They had the screens across the screen. Mm -hmm. That's the only ad. Now you got the television coming and you got the internet and everything. So what's the reality of the market and so forth? The market's uh, very difficult. Okay. Mo most independent films, even when they get distribution, yeah. the filmmakers might never see a dollar back on their investment. Okay. You know, okay. they get satisfied by an audience watching their product. Mm -hmm. There's so many subcategories of distributors. Right. I mean, Miramax started as okay. the mini yeah. major, okay. and um, that gave a lot of hope for filmmakers that they didn't have to worry about dealing with the system mm -hmm. as the Hollywood mold. And then, you know, as things went, it branched out, and then you got the sharks and the people that are real about distributing your product and the people that aren't. And it's a real murky world. And uh, lots of independent filmmakers don't know the business end. They know how to make the picture. And so what happens well, when... The artists the don't know the business. Yeah. Right. And, and then when the business end comes... Separate. Certain distributors might take advantage of the artist because they don't know. They just go, oh, I have a distributor. They sign a piece of paper and they never see a dollar. Same thing happens to musicians, I think. Oh, there are a lot of oh, musicians absolutely. have been ripped off re regally by yes. the hustlers, right? Yeah. It's like it's part of show business. Yeah, and is. show business can be pretty brutal. Mm -hmm. for it's the a murky soul. ocean there, Harold. It's a murky for ocean. for the creative souls that come along because it's the creative souls that have the the right attitude, mm -hmm. but th that isn't a business. No, but they don't think like that. They though. don't think like a businessman, exactly. which is bottom line. Yep. But it, there's many more avenues of distribution than there has been. Uh, like we only had, I can remember, you were at home box office. Mm -hmm. I can remember, I've been doing television in a small scale. We got the fifth porter pack came off the vote from Japan. <laughs> Went off and started doing interviews, and I did a program with the man who was at the time, this was about 1973, way the hell back, and it was a man who was the head at that time of home box office, where you came to work. And we went there, and they had just had the Telstar, because you have these iterations of um, technology, right? And uh, they come, and um, they used to, you know what they used to have to do for films? They had. Uh, home box office, right? They were, industry was, they, you didn't have the big build out and everything, and you had no satellite. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. And it was sad. So they had to, in when they, those days, to have a film, a feature film, it was two inch high beam. Are you familiar with that? They were as big as 35 millimeter reels, right. huge yeah. things, Absolutely. and they had to have two to get an hour per, and they had to ship by Mule or Pony Express or maybe Mail or what the hell ever, to each head end across the country. Mm -hmm. And they had just put up the Telstar, where you have a satellite in right. the sky, geosynchronous, mm -hmm. and you could just beam it up and then put the dish on the day and it go everywhere. Happy as kids with <laughs> the toy they were. But his name was Gerald Levin. He came to become the chairman of, of the whole company of Time Warner and everything until Turner and everything. But he was happy as a lark in that. So what I'm getting at with that little story, mm -hmm. he was happy that they've got this machine. It was as happy as... That like I a new toy. Make, <laughs> that, yeah, like, no, happy that I can make email work, you know, yeah. because it's something new coming. So it's coming new all the time. The yeah. new possibilities coming. And uh, those make all... That, make us, and that changes the character of it. It's becoming much more democratic. Yes. Everybody yes. has access to doing, making that. Mm -hmm. There was no way anybody individual could make television before the Porter Pack. Yeah. Well, in our days, no right now, the machines were huge. It had to be institutions. Oh, absolutely. Right you know but what I'm saying? What's so great about the times that we live in now mm. is because of the internet. Yeah, that's filmmakers, yeah. musicians have an avenue mm -hmm. to put their stuff out with no complications, whether it's YouTube, Blip TV, there's so many different avenues that you could find an audience and that could enjoy what you're trying to do. Yeah. Whereas before, the internet and being able to stream long shows, it was just a little bit and they didn't have the technology down. And YouTube has been like an incredible tool for Oh, yeah. Many, many people. Yeah, YouTube, we do YouTube. Just like yourself. Right. How many hours do you well, have on I YouTube? Well, i got about 800 up there now of programs such that this will be up on YouTube by tomorrow. Oh. we oh. take. And it'll be up there. And also, it's got, when we signed up, it was the fellows who started it. It wasn't right. Google. You know, the Google right. bought it and everything. Yeah. And when we started it, this is news for people in the general audience, so it might be of interest, because YouTube's a great, it's like MGM yeah. for distribution archive.
in the sky right. and everything. And when we did it, you had you could have any length of program you wanted. I do hour as the standard uh, format and everything. And you could have any length, but whatever you put up, you had to have it uh, compressed down to an MPEG uh, under 100 megabytes. Right. So that's pretty small film. Yeah. A thing for a thing. Now I looked at YouTube. They've changed it. You can only put up ten minutes. Mm -hmm. That's because the average time somebody looks at it, it must be youth or something. Is yeah. two minutes. Exactly. The channel yeah. surface. Yeah. Their attention uh, span is this but then, short. But then you had a ten minute piece. You put, up, but it can be twenty up to twenty four gigabytes. The piece. I mean, it's yeah, like exactly. high def. You wow. can put it up. You know, and so. It's coming, and yeah. bandwidth is coming, yeah. and the, the computer is coming with all kinds of new possibilities. So you're going to be able to have really good quality stuff up. Then you've got Blip is another, mm -hmm. and those are distribution archives for that. And so that's something that's impacting what you're doing, I think. It's inspiring us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. It's inspiring us to do, you know. And the most popular program in the world is you, new, uh, America's Got Talent. Did you? Uh, maybe it's Havel Channel. No, no, no. No, no. I, lo I watch C SPAN. <laughs> you know, long, boring talks about economic policy. You know, I mean, there's nothing. But, they, but that's a, they've got, that's the most popular program. One of our crew was over there. Paul Perot with his program, I'm Not Your President. We got a guy here with the program, I'm Not Your President. He's great. And then there's the colors. They do creative stuff every week. But they do video mixing, and every week in that half hour, they get to high art. Mm -hmm. And they're young, and they just know how to mix the stuff, and yeah. it's all happening spontaneously and everything. Well, it's funny what you say with American yeah, Idol, because I remember yeah. with American Idol, like when I was growing up, you yeah. had Star Search with Ed McMahon. When I was and it, it was almost yeah. like what American Idol is. It just didn't go to the level of yeah, you know, that show. <laughs> I was trying to think what I grew up with. Somebody, somebody, the amateur, Ted Max Amateur oh, yeah. Hour. Yeah. Now, you don't go back that far. That was Ted Max. That's back. I yeah, but back, I could watch it on I YouTube. I go back to when there was no television, gentlemen. I go back you to when don't there was go back radio. that far. I do, too. I go back to 1935. What, Uncle Milty? No, Uncle Milty is <laughs> new. Past him? No, no, I go back to... To the shadow? And this is a... Radio series? Yes, <laughs> all that we do, but they also had the soap operas for the ladies washing clothes on Monday or Tuesday and Wednesday or whatever. They had one, and they had the one, it was, uh, you know, on the radio. There was no television, just radio. Different medium, television's different. But they had a radio, and they had one that was called Portia Faces Light. <laughs> you know, and then, then another one I can remember, Just Plain... Bill. <laughs> you know, that was another program. They had these things, these uh, radio shows that ladies would listen to mostly. You know, they called them soap operas on the radio. It's funny. Sorry, it, I'm like a dinosaur. No, you're not. In California, they have uh, um, a radio station out there that just does all the old radio shows. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And, and my, my wife and I, mm. Paula Schwartz, she's mm. also the president of the company. Okay. Uh, we just loved it. We can't find it over here, but, yeah, you know, yeah, everything well, from you, the you, shadow yeah. and they this. They shadow and lonely. Ranger, but we would sit down in, in the house and just turn it on and just you just zone out in your imagination and the voices and the sound thing, effects yeah. like yes. just brought you right Mother's there. Mother's cave, turn out your lights. <laughs> we would do it. We kid, turn out your lights, and some clown would turn out the lights. <laughs> Weird stories and murders too. <laughs> oh, he's good. Yeah, yeah, he's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows? But, in anyway, the we're the field, I mean, but it is a history of media, and it's all coming in. Niagara proportions now. Absolutely. And I really congratulate. And you're also encouraging people, the creative community, yes, to think about being in touch with your site. We to let, why don't we? Do you mind if I tell them what your site is? Absolutely. Would you mind, oh, as the director of redevelopment, if we give them the <laughs> oh, site? Very happy. You sure? Yeah, it's okay. 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 Sounds like a good okay. plan. Well, it's Indy I N D I E G E M S F I L M S dot Com. Com. Yes, sir. Did you get that? Is that okay? That's it. No, That's perfect. the thing. And there, that I've makes the whole there, show worth it. <laughs> it's a good site, and everything's there, and everything. And what you're doing is you got comp you got people s asking them to submit scripts. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, we have a there program. There should be venues like we have this as a venue. There should be venues for the expression of all aspects of what people think is important using multimedia. There are more venues like. Acting, there's only a few people ever make it in acting. Mm -hmm. 
you know, just a tiny, or poets. Poetry, well, he, poetry. But you know how the, I, I'll there's say this. There's got to be venues for expression of the goods of civilization, which can make it a venue for people to express what they really think. We're, but, we're happy here at public access because it opened to the people to express that. Do you, do you understand but, what I'm uh, Absolutely, but I don't think star, that it, it's oh, going to no. bring a bunch of I, I don't feel that an actor didn't make it if they never got on television or made a film. If they're practicing their craft, they make it. But in order to practice your craft, you have to have a venue where you can practice right. the craft. And oh, absolutely. You if you're not on a soundstage with a $10 million project in Washington, you know, if it's all for the star only, yeah, you got a star thing. Also, That's what I, I think America's got talent. The great I don't know. Everybody thinks they're going to be a star. I don't know why. I, what, what I'm saying is, is that um, the greatest talents in the world probably walk this planet undiscovered. That's what I see every and day in New York City as I walk around. We, we have a God. thing. Yeah. We have a you thing. You know what I'm talking well, about? Exactly. You do. We have a thing at um, Indie Gems. Uh, it's called uh, Fund My Script. Okay, thank you. And, yeah, talk um, about it. I'll have Derek. <laughs> Talk Derek, a little bit about the Fund My Script program. Yeah. Well, essentially, it's just a program to get new emerging artists to submit a script for a short film uh -huh. that will read, judge, and the winner will make their film for them. Well, now that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there very many <coughs> venues that have that kind of an offer out? Does are there ads and billboards to say? They exist, but not the way we're doing it, though. Okay, talk. Yeah. Um, it's very important because you offer mm -hmm. a venue for a script writer. Exactly, and we have professional people working on it. Okay, and right. We're offering something concrete for them. Right. You know, right. a finished product that, right. that will be put into film festivals, shown to, peop shown to the right people, and it'll be their own thing. They'll okay, that's the rights. Okay, that, mm -hmm. that, that's very important. That yeah. would be the top prize, yes. I would presume, mm -hmm. because yes. making a film mm -hmm. is a big proposition and can be very big. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Right, mo deal. Most of the competitions, mm -hmm. uh, the winners receive a cash prize yeah. and, you know, a little blurb on the internet that, yeah. you know, you won this certain competition. And the way Derek and I and Paula feel is, is that the most important thing a writer can have mm -hmm. is his product or her product produced mm -hmm. by a professional Emmy-winning team such as our company, yeah. and they retain the rights, as Derek said, mm -hmm. and we also will place it in key film festivals and try to make as much noise for that artist as possible. Why don't we have a lot of people like you for the f creative filmmaking, a lot of companies that do that, or, or venues, or organizations that people could send their scripts to. Other, you have to, normally a writer has to find a, or a publisher. Mm -hmm. You have to find an agent. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you have to find the publisher, and then you have to get. And it's hard. It's a hard yeah. scrabble thing. I suppose it's the same in the film yeah. industry. Mm -hmm. But there should be places. What there should be is avenues so that the creative capability, mm -hmm. what would be called the goods of civilization, the real art. It should be for painting, it should be for sculpture, it should be for theater, it should be venues for the expression of the human spirit that aren't some assembly line thing right. that you're doing to make bread. Yeah, absolutely. You understand? We were also and I think that's <laughs> going to become an essential of society mm -hmm. because I think that the distributing of income to people mm -hmm. is going to have to be done by something else other than the labor theory of value and I think we're heading for real trouble on the on that front of distributing income to people only through their having what they call a job. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of time for people. We're going to have to have an alternative way to distribute income, or some socialist thing or something, or some ownership dispensing of ownership that brings income to the people. There's going to be leisure. There's going to be leisure for the masses when only they've been able to call practicality as being uh, answerable to the bell at the mill. Mm -hmm. And that's changing. Yeah. And so we're going to want to be encouraging individuality and expression. And we're going to have to have venues that aren't necessarily even tied into the, to the market. Absolutely. It, the goods of civilization, poetry, art, all well, these things. Which speaking are given about such that, short trip yes. now. We, we, we and were, there's a dying need, and everybody wants to be in that yeah. realm, and there should be venues for right. it because there's so few, apparently, because so many people want to be there and can't find a niche. Well, They're waiting on tables to make uh, bread. Well, speaking on that, bread. with the Fund My Script program, mm -hmm. uh, we were also inspired when uh, Derek. Um, 
came to me and uh, told me about his father, who's a, a wonderful, wonderful artist, mm -hmm. a unique artist, and Major, looking with um, venues to... He, right now, he's doing stuff predominantly in pencil, mm -hmm. um, but it's like some stuff you've never seen before, uh -huh. though. Um, it's surrealistic, erotic, right. mm -hmm. kind of, it's, you get... Every time you look at it, you see something different. Basically. Okay. You can right. see it so on the internet. Right. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Artist. God yeah. bless the artist. Yeah. <laughs> well, you yeah. can pull up his work on the internet. The artists are the antenna of the race. They mm -hmm. pick yes. up on things first. Exactly. Yeah, we need them. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was saying that if the, your audience was uh, wanted to see yeah. what he was speaking about. Yeah. No, I can give you his website. It's um, Eddie Berto Marrero. It's H-E-R-I-B-E-R-T-O. You went too fast. Oh, I'm sorry. H-E-R-I. At least for my crowd. No, no. You know, my <laughs> crowd is more like... A, what do you do? <laughs> one letter at okay. a time. H E R I B E R T O Marrero, M A R R E R O dot com. Okay, that's right. Yeah, okay. that's, with that's easier to write down <laughs> with a lead pencil. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, um, it's just a collection of his work with a biography of him as well. He's yeah. been at it for upwards of 50 years now, I believe. Okay, good. Incredible yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, no, it's just interesting stuff that I think once out there, people would dig it. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. Absolutely. There needs more venues for that. And you, yeah. you, need you guys more are off. Website. I can't hear you. <laughs> they give us the rap sign. We got about three minutes. Okay. Got to wrap it up. Let me just say real quickly mm -hmm. uh, that um, also... We have, um, who is um, our VP of the technical productions out there in California, William Stephen Howell, mm -hmm. a three-time Emmy Award winning mm -hmm. uh, artist, and he is uh, the one who is directing the Hollywood Sarah film for okay, the company. Okay, that's the one you're doing now. Yeah, very, very interesting fella. Um, uh -huh. Also worked for uh, Michael Jackson, has his personal photographer for many years. Okay, yeah. And... Um, He's a great guy, and I just wanted to just let the audience know that. Okay, well, Look out for him. Let me just say, Willie, maybe you could run the graphics in, if you could, please. We'll get the graphics in. Looks like we're going to have to close down a little early. But uh, we're talking with uh, Greg Canastaro and, and Derek Mararo. Mm -hmm. Mararo, if Mararo. I got that right? Yes, Mararo. Sir. Yes, sir. And they're both from Indie uh, Gems Films. And I just congratulate you both. I think it's wonderful what you're doing, setting up this context for expression of the human you know, human creativity, because the, the, the times call for that kind of a situation. And I really think it's wonderful what you're doing. I'm really glad. It's good to see you again. Well, thank you so for I'm having us. a little short here, but um, congratulations. Thank Thanks a lot much. for coming in. All the best. And we'll put the website up at the end. But again, I'll tell it. I'll do it to my audience, and you could do it to yours. Yeah. I-N-D-I-E-G-E-M-S-F. I L M S films dot com dot com dot com dot com com yes sir there now that's there for you the, go. that's for the young crowd they can do <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for coming in thank you uh, Harold it's always a pleasure good good good, 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 to, good to meet you, you. good we we'll have to stay in touch Definitely. and be in touch with one another yes thank you in the audience for viewing we're going to put a little uh, something at the end of this to fill out the hour we ran uh, and there are some terribly interesting cases in the United States Supreme Court on that uh, some years back when um, property was much more respected than it is today. Mm -hmm. Today the typical owner, by typical owner I will say a stockholder, mm -hmm. we're now talking about the relationship of the stockholder to the assets which underlie his stock. And in a certain sense embody a good deal of the technology that would be included oh, yes, within the corporation. But that's, a, another, that's another point. Mm -hmm. um, the stockholder on the average, receives about one twelfth of the income that the assets that he beneficially owns produces. In real terms. In real terms. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is there's no mystery about it. In general, uh, state and federal corporate income taxes mm -hmm. and the employer's share of Social Security tax mm -hmm. take roughly half the income. So you've lost half your property if you're, if you're a, a capital owner. The wages of the property. But so that's the property. Right. All right. The United yeah. States Supreme Court has said, but that is uh -huh. the property. Okay. I mean, if, you, if you don't get yeah. what it produces, you don't own it. That's, yeah. It's just that yeah. simple. Yeah. Boards of directors of corporations typically uh, use half 
I'm sorry, mm -hmm. use three-fourths of the remaining half yes. to finance the growth of the corporation. Mm -hmm. Now, you put half together with three-fourths and you've lost seven-eighths. Mm -hmm. Seven-eighths mm -hmm. of the property has gone bye-bye. Mm -hmm. And there are certain frictions in what I will call the coercive trickle-down economy. Mm -hmm. That's how most income is distributed in America, through coercive trickle-down. Mm -hmm. Uh, that shrinks it down from an eighth down to a twelfth. Now, the only point I, I think our listeners should remember here is that when we speak of the income earning power of capital, we're talking about something that is twelve times greater than it appears. Oh, all right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Twelve times as powerful. To say it another way, the income that a half a million dollar capital estate would earn for you under that uh, attenuated property arrangement, mm -hmm. you could receive from a mere $47,000 investment mm -hmm. if you got what it really produced. Right, right, right. So there's a big difference. And is the tendency through time toward eroding that ever more as we Absolutely, time, right? absolutely, mm -hmm. and we'll mm -hmm. come to that. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to talk about the reasons for it. Yes. The the ownership of capital in the American economy was estimated by Benjamin Franklin in colonial days oh. to be in the top 5% of the population. Uh, it was a, an agrarian economy. Land was overwhelmingly the dominant form of capital. Mm -hmm. The structures were trivial and weak and not very valuable, it could be quickly rebuilt. Mm -hmm. um, some boats and ships uh, were, were included in that, but land was where it was. 5% mm -hmm. of the people owned it. Interestingly enough, in the last half century, a series of studies have been made on it. Not studies connected with each other, but a a succession of studies of the same phenomena. Mm -hmm. And those studies all show that all the capital ownership of any income significance is still in the top 5% of the wealth holders. Amazing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's re uh -huh. remarkable. Uh -huh. um, I estimate that there was a bump in, uh, from 1862 for about 35 years. Homestead Act. Resulting from the Homestead Acts. Uh -huh. It was the policy that uh, President Lincoln was elected on. It was a policy of um, parceling out federally owned land that wasn't otherwise being used mm -hmm. in, um, in very limited acreages, usually 160 acres, uh, sometimes more. Uh, and it was connected with the individuals living on the land and uh, building on it and cultivating it and using it in production, in other words. But it was a deliberate policy to get capital ownership into the American people. Uh -huh. It ceased with the closing of the frontier. It's never been repeated. And it never existed except in the uh, land area. Uh -huh. Not the industrial structures. The Not the industrial so structures, uh -huh. no. Now, Thus, what I have said is that the ownership of the second factor of production, because mm -hmm. what, what I've done is to say the ownership of capital mm -hmm. by an individual is a way of earning income. He is a capital worker, mm -hmm. in the same sense that a labor worker is a labor worker. Mm -hmm. He works through his labor power, which he owns in a free society, mm -hmm. in a slave society he doesn't, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and the capital owner, if he got the wages of his capital mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fully, would be a full-fledged capital worker mm -hmm. and would engage in production in the same way. And, and that the labor worker does. And by worker, we mean worker at all levels of the economy, from chairman of the board of a major bank on through to the person who wields a wheelbarrow. It's labor in all aspects of its input. This to has the nothing to do with job classification right. or with management versus uh, right. sub-management or anything. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 
ways in which people, human beings, citizens, right. as mm -hmm. defined in the United States Constitution, uh, ways in which citizens engage or can engage in production. Yes. Now, I'd like, I'd like to turn uh, to the first chart mm -hmm. that we have brought with us, mm -hmm. which, uh, which is, a, is a terribly interesting chart. There's more there than meets the eye. It runs from 1776, of course, the American political revolution. Mm -hmm. But strangely enough, this is one of the most mystical coincidences in history. That is the date of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, as most historians date it. Mm -hmm. um, now, the interesting aspect of 1776 in terms of these two kinds of workers mm -hmm. was that <clears throat> if measured by market forces, and that is essentially what was, the market wasn't, wasn't really rigged in 1776, mm -hmm. significantly as it is today. There's market price of, of labor, market prices of uh, people's services. 95% of the input into production, by that I mean 95% of the goods and services were produced by labor, mm -hmm. labor. 5% mm -hmm. by capital. Uh, it was mostly land. Land was low in value. It was plentiful. And you couldn't do much with it without copious applications of labor. Toil. Toil mm. of the most severe kind. Mm. Lines are wrapped around a corner. It's and, awful. And I would be hard pressed to believe that all, I, I, listen, there are pockets Isn't of. Isn't something that could be done short of the court? Something in something terms of, in of, terms of re complaint, some sort of system of massive complaint to get massive numbers of saying enough already. I think if without them having to put out a lot of money, that's well, what I'm saying. Well, I, I don't. I mean, somehow maybe it's the way the, or the, the way the system is set up is so prejudiced. You, ha you have to no, know the way the system is set up, Harold, mm. is. There, there are certain ways to remedy problems, yeah. and you. I mean, certainly there's there are individuals who want to, uh, who want to go out and resolve the problem themselves and, and and picket the police. Okay, that's one way to do it. That's mm -hmm. an exercise of your first amendment okay. rights. The the other way to do to it is to settlement. Okay. Is, is, is to sue, yeah. and and the that city costs money. I the city is not going one to. One of the problems in this universe and any parallel okay. universes that may exist by string theory is that there's a system of limitation on time, and we run out of time because we were late getting together. Yes. There are many details we could have done. Yes. But I really thank you for coming thank in you. and that we want to do everything we can. The young man's name is D. Andrew Marshall. Yes. You want to give your phone number? Yes. Here? My number is 212-571-3030. Say it again, D. D, D Andrew. 212-571-3030 and I'm located at 225 Broadway, Suite 1804. And of course, my email address is mr.marshall at hotmail.com. Uh, I, I do answer my phone calls. I, I try to consult people as best I can. And uh, if, you're, if you're available on June 17th, between 5 and 8 o'clock, please come down to the uh, New York Public Library at 7 West 126th Street, where uh, Let My People Flow, <laughs> as well as uh, Behind the Bench, will be sponsoring another forum. Uh, and we'll be educating our community, and we're trying to expand this uh, this movement. Well, keep up the good work, young man. Do it. I just think it ought to be, it's egregious, and it ought to be, and we didn't even hardly get to the thing that's going on in Arizona with all the immigration and that yes. kind of stuff now, because that's getting very dangerously fascistic in his feeling. Indeed it and is. And it is that kind of thing. Thanks for the good work. Keep it up. I didn't mean to harass you with a lot of questions. Hey, I, I would just like to see the, the situation addressed. You're no worse than my, any judge or my father. Worse than your father? <laughs> I can't believe it turns that. Oh, that's it's, it's Really, the, the, question, the judge yeah. is one thing, yeah, but no, the father, no, man, he, that's really, he, he really gave it to he you, He peppered right? me with a lot well, of questions also. Well, something for you for having come up so beautifully. Well. Thank you very Good much. To meet you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So that's the end of the program, and thanks for coming. Glad we got it in in the tail end. We'll have to continue this later. Look forward to it. Thank you very much. Line. Okay, thank you for viewing. Good night, everybody. So I'm sorry you came late and everything, but... You, you know, I was sitting out there for... Mm.